Mr. President, when I gave my first speech on the Senate floor 12 years ago, or when I cast my first vote in the House 26 years ago, I had really no way to anticipate the challenges and opportunities that were ahead of us. I come to the floor today grateful to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and on both sides of the Capitol. When we agree and when we don't, we're bound by the Constitution to seek a more perfect union. Of course, I'm most grateful to Missourians who've given me the chance to work for them as a county official, as Missouri Secretary of State, and in both the United States House and the United States Senate. Missouri is where the country comes together. The North meets the South, the East meets the West. No states have more states that, at its borders than us, and only one as many states as we have. We've been the population center of America for the last five decades, kind of moving down Interstate 44 as the population has moved west and south. We sit in the middle of the biggest piece of contiguous agricultural farmland in the world, and the only one that has its own built-in transportation system, the Mississippi River Valley. St. Louis is sometimes described as the westernmost eastern city, and Kansas City really maybe more like Denver and Omaha than it is St. Louis. Springfield, where I live, kind of looks to the west and the south, to Tulsa and to Fayetteville. The boot heel of our state is the Delta South in every way. The economy, the topography, uh, what happens there is reflective of other places more than it is the rest of our state. I was in northern Missouri quite a bit this summer, and northern Missouri, those two counties that border Iowa, one of the people with me one day when I was Secretary of State said, when we're up here, I always feel like we're on top of the world. And I never go to northern Missouri now unless I feel like I'm on top of the world. Of course, every senator thinks their state is unique, and it is. A couple of years ago, I spent a few minutes each day trying to figure out, for about a period of six months, wondering how the other 99 members got here. <laughs> and with a couple exceptions, I was able to figure it out. There's still <laughs> some question in my mind about a couple of our friends, but uh, as I looked at it, I figured out somebody has unique people skills, other people have extraordinary political skills. Maybe it's the ability to quickly understand complicated things or the ability to explain complicated things so that other people can understand them. Most of the time, however, we just have an incredible amount of wasted talent. If you could take the collective talent of the 100 United States senators and make the most of it, there is absolutely no telling what might happen. Now, part of that's because the Senate isn't expected to work efficiently. We don't have many rules, and what does get done usually gets done by either unanimous consent or total exhaustion. Those are our two stopping points. Uh, our federal government was designed by people who didn't trust government and didn't want too much of it. They made it hard to get things done. The, um, they opted for inefficiency, and that inefficiency is really mind-boggling to people who are more familiar with the parliamentary system, where if it doesn't get done, if it isn't efficient, it fails. We certainly aren't built that way. We've clearly found new levels of inefficiency in the past decade. One big bill at the end of the year to fund the government, plus whatever the four leaders of the House and Senate can agree to add to it. And once again, we're at that year-ending process to cobble together some kind of result. Now, the only thing worse than the way we do it would be not doing it. The only thing worse than the way we do it would just decide not to get our work done and see what happens. So we're once again down to the next four weeks to get our work done, or even better, the next three weeks. Wouldn't be bad if we got it done in the next two weeks, but we're following a pattern here. In my view, we followed for too long. You know, I've seen the standard process of regular order work. In my first decade in the Congress, um, it never worked perfectly, but it came pretty close to the standard that had been set for two, for 
for two centuries. There was, uh, there's good reason for how a bill becomes a law, whether you first saw it on a film strip, like I probably did, or Schoolhouse Rock, like my kids did. You know how it's supposed to work. Members of a committee and staff who know the most about an issue, they hold hearings, they mark up a bill, the bill's to be debated and amended on the floor of both the House and the Senate before it goes to the president to be signed or vetoed. For 225 years, the topics of what to fund and how to pay for it dominated the congressional debate. And we frankly need to get back to that, where people see what's going on and members feel bought into what's going on. But then and now, during that whole time, whether regular order was working or not, the rules of the Senate really require finding someone on the other side to work with. Um, there have never been 50, there have never been more than 56 popularly elected Republican senators, and only a handful of times have there been 60 or more Democrats. Finding someone on the other side to work with produces the most lasting results. A couple of Congress ago, there were 52 on my side and 48 on the other side. My staff decided to be interesting, came to me one day and said, we just thought it'd be interesting to check and see how many of the 48 Democrats you'd figured out how to be the principal sponsor of a bill with? And the answer was 44. I thought that was a pretty good number. My point then and now is you don't have to agree on everything to work together. You just have to agree on one thing. And if you find that one thing you agree on, and frankly, particularly if you're successful, both the members working together and their staffs think, well, gee, we could do that again. In healthcare research, Senator Murray and I, along with Chairman Cole on the House side and eventually, and the ranking member and then Chairman DeLauro, worked together to significantly change NIH research. Secretary Senator Klobuchar, and I've done lots of things together. We've worked on the travel economy, and it's a big part of our economy. We worked to rewrite the workplace harassment standards for the Senate, we worked on adoption issues. Uh, Senator Brown and I passed a bill, advanced manufacturing. We'd known each other for years. Once we figured out we could pass one bill together, we passed five. It, it has a good effect. Senator Stabenow and I have worked so hard on certified community behavioral health centers. Uh, we've worked on this for well over a decade now. We've made, I think, incredible progress. Neither of us would have gotten that done by ourselves. Senator Capito and Shaheen and Portman and Manchin all worked with me and our committee on uh, opioid and dependency issues. We were making real progress. I think the pandemic set that progress back, but shouldn't stop us from moving forward. Senator Coons founded with me the Law Enforcement Caucus. We've worked every time it came up to expand the, and the Victims of Child Abuse Act, the volunteer community efforts. Um, the other retiring members I'd want to mention that I've worked with as well, Senator Leahy and Senator Shelby, both on the Appropriations Committee and the Rules Committee. You know, on the Appropriations Committee, I got to see the last of uh, Senator Inouye and Senator Cochran still at their best, Barbara Mikulski, people who didn't have to have a perfect result to have a result, and it was wonderful to get to watch them work. Senator Inhofe, obviously, totally focused on what it takes to defend the country. He was here for his remarks, his farewell speech the other day, and pointed out that he'd found somebody that he didn't agree with on hardly anything, Barbara Boxer, uh, and they came up with public works bill after public works bill. Senator Burr, who's leaving, has been my chairman in the Intelligence Committee and so capable and so knowledgeable in that committee. He's been really incredibly helpful to me. Senator Portman and I have been at the leadership table in both the House and the Senate. I've been in more meetings with Bob Portman than I've ever been with anybody that I've never served on a committee with, uh, and it's been great. Pat Toomey, of course, brings incredible understanding of finance issues and the economy. My longest relationships, of course, are with my 
House colleagues, Senator Thune, Senator Moran, and I all came to the House at the same time, along with Senator Stabenow. Senator Moran, Senator Bozeman, and I all came to the Senate together from the House. Senator Cardin, Senator Graham, Senator Cassidy, Senator Blackburn, Senator Brown, Senator Wicker, and others have been part of my work life for a long, long time. Together we face big challenges. You know, after 9-11, we saw a new terrorist threat. I was in the middle of that discussion of continuity of government, the sudden realization that our government could dramatically change, and we hadn't thought about what might happen if it did change. Dick Gephardt, who my fellow Missourian, the Democratic leader at the time, and I came up with uh, this structure for post-9-11 compensation for victims uh, that worked, and unfortunately, it's worked following now with a number of tragedies, but it was a, something I was able to be there as we put it together. You know, at that time, Senator President Bush said, uh, we'd bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies. And four presidents have now followed that standard. For me, legislative highlights would, of course, include what happens at NIH, where I've been able to be part of Quad of, of increasing by 50% over eight years with Senator Murray and others, the commitment we made to health care research. I mentioned Senator Stabenow earlier, but the, the mental health efforts, the changing that I think we've all seen here in just the last few years of how we talk about that issue and how we think, how we understand we need to respond to that issue is something I'm particularly proud of. Now, maybe have an act, a, a bill with Senator Heinrich, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act that every conservation group in America is supportive of. Uh, maybe uh, we can add that to the list of things that I'm going to consider a great accomplishment uh, before we leave here. And it has to go in that big bill I talked about earlier that we put together here at the end. You know, I've had an incredible opportunity to be responsible for two inaugurations. It's one of the most important things we do, that particular event, not be being responsible for it. 100 million people watch live. Hundred, tens of millions of people around the world watch all or part of it after that. It's so important we get it right. In 2017, I decided our theme would be the peaceful transition of power. And I remember at both inaugurations, I, I quoted the only thing I repeated, I think, at those two inaugurations it was President Reagan who said what we, in, who said in 1981, what we do here today is, is commonplace and miraculous. Commonplace because we've done it every four years since 1789. Miraculous because we've done it every four years since 1789. 2021, so well this time, let's talk about our need to have a more perfect union. You know, the, the founders didn't promise a perfect union. They were in that place pretty reasonable in their anticipation of what we could do and what we could be. But they did promise a more perfect union, and that's the effort we continue to be part of. Uh, to get all of that done, so many other people have to make it possible. All of us appreciate every one of our families and I think we all appreciate each other's families because no, better than anybody else, we know what families mean and, and uh, how important it is that your family's part of this. You know, my, my mom and dad were dairy farmers. They never suggested there were any limits to what a person could do in America. No sense that you couldn't do everything you wanted to do. I'm most grateful to Abby. My wife, I wouldn't be in the Senate and wouldn't have stayed as long in the House as I did if Abby hadn't been willing to work so much, so hard to make it easier for me what I love to do. And uh, we are full partners and I am grateful for that. All of my children and even their children were too often being asked to defend what I did or what I believed or more often what people assumed I believed but they got to be part of history too. Charlie Blunt was flying on Air Force One with President Bush on his second birthday. Who gets to do that? 
I will admit though, however, no one in my family said, ever said I wish you'd quit, but when I did announce, did decide I was going to leave two years ago, I noticed that no one said, are you sure? <laughs> Except Abby, who did say, are you sure? I've often said if you can only have one skill, that one skill should be hiring. And what a great staff that skill and good luck have produced for me. My incredible chief of staff, Stacy McBride, has been responsible for so much of what we've gotten done. My deputy chief for the state, Derek Coates, led a great team that did so much for our state and in helping people deal with the federal government. My deputy chief of staff here, Richard Eddings, is along with me completing 26 years in, in the Congress and 26 years of working together. He managed the details for the WHIPS office in the House and the details for our office in the Senate. The Rules Committee staff takes responsibility to help manage the daily infrastructure of the Senate. No issues too small or too big from everything from security decisions for the presidential inauguration to a recent call to ask whether we could release someone's pet owl in the Russell courtyard so that owl would have a home and we'd all appreciate it. Senator Klobuchar and I quickly decided it probably wouldn't be good for the Russell Courtyard or the Al, and so the Al was not released. The Republican Policy Committee staff deals with every vote on the floor, every nomination, every issue. There's a paper out there explaining all of those things, every bill that's been filed, uh, every amendment, even to the dreaded uh, Votorama, that staff is getting an amendment ready so voters know what they're seeing. Uh, let me end this farewell with two things. One's another thank you to Missouri voters. You know, my view of the need to find a solution to a problem really took place and took shape in the Greene County Courthouse. I've been in all 115 of our counties since I announced I wasn't going to run again. There's been some question in my house as to the judgment of that schedule, but we're through that now, so it's done. Uh, and, you know, in a lot of those courthouses, I was visiting with county officials, I said, in my view, there's nowhere in America you're more likely to get a solution to a governmental problem than a county courthouse. Bill with local elected officials who want to do everything they can possibly do for you to feel like you left with everything done that could possibly be done. And then... You know, to be the first Republican Secretary of State elected in Missouri when I, in 52 years when I won that office in 1984, I never thought my leading argument was, why don't you vote for the first Republican ever? I thought it was, if you vote for me, I'll do this job and you'll be pleased that you did give me a chance to do it. Um, so grateful to them and grateful to that experience. And then a story that Senator Klobuchar has told more often than I have. When I became the chief deputy whip, on my way to becoming the whip of the House of the first month of my second term in the Congress, I moved from the Cannon Building to the, to the Capitol Building, and I looked up on the top of a bookcase in my office, my new office in the Congress, and there was this this bust of a person up there, and I said to my staff, well, let's find out who that is. And so they come back a couple of weeks later, and they've got these newspaper articles from the 30s and the 60s, and they say, well, nobody knows who that is. And it's obvious when you get that bust down and look at it that it's a cleric, it's a, and so it was the unknown cleric, and it's been with me ever since. It's in one of my offices here, the point of the unknown clerk, somebody, this is a bus that was put in the Capitol probably no later than, no earlier than 1830. And by 1930, nobody had any idea who it was. I had lots of meetings with new freshman members in the house when I was the whip, and a number of meetings with people just who happened to be around and would listen to this. I said, the point of this is somebody famous enough that they'd make a bust and put it in the Capitol and then forget who they are point is, what we do here is more important than who we are. 
Thanks for letting me do part of it with you. And Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President-elect, Mr. Vice President-elect, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States of America. Today, the legislative, the executive, the judicial branches of our constitutional government come together for the 58th inauguration of the President of the United States. Millions of people all over the world will watch and will listen to this event. 36 years ago at his first inauguration, it was also the first inauguration on this side of the Capitol, President Ronald Reagan said that what we do here is both commonplace and miraculous. Commonplace every four years since 1789 when President George Washington took this exact same oath. Miraculous, because we've done it every four years since 1789, and the example it sets for democracies everywhere. Washington believed the inauguration of the second president would be more important than the inauguration of the first. Many people had taken control of a government up until then, but few people had ever turned that control willingly over to anyone else. And as important as the transfer of the, the first transfer of power was, many historians believe that the next election was even more important. When in 18 and one, one group of people, arguably for the first time ever in history, willingly, if not enthusiastically, gave control of the government to people they believed had a dramatically different view of what the government would, should, and could do. After that election that actually discovered a flaw in the Constitution itself, which was, which was remedied by the 12th Amendment, Thomas Jefferson at that inauguration, beyond the chaos of the election that had just passed, said, we are all Republicans we are all Federalists. After four years of civil war, Lincoln's second inaugural speech tried to find reason for the continued war when he pointed out that both sides prayed to the same God. He'd earlier written about those fervent prayers that one side must be and both sides may be wrong. But in 1865, he looked to the future and the memorable moment in that speech was with malice toward none and charity for all. In the middle of the depression, the country was told that the only thing we had to fear was fear itself. And President Kennedy talked about the obligation in democracy to country. The great question that day was ask what you can do for your country. So we come to this place again, commonplace and miraculous, a national moment of celebration, but not a, not a celebration of victory, a celebration of democracy. Well, I should have known when Senator Klobuchar got involved, at least there'd be a touch of snow up here this morning. Of all the things we'd considered, I don't think snow was on my agenda until I walked out the door a moment ago, but thank you, Senator Klobuchar, and thanks to the other members of the Joint Congressional Committee on the inauguration as we officially begin the 59th inaugural ceremony. I also want to thank the Joint Committee staff and our partners, particularly our security partners, for the, day, the way they've dealt with unprecedented circumstances. When I chaired the inauguration four years ago, I shared President Reagan's 1981 description of this event as commonplace and miraculous. Commonplace because we've done it every four years since 1789. Miraculous because we've done it every four years since 1789. Americans have celebrated this moment during war, during depression, and now during pandemic. Once again, 
All three branches of our government come together as the Constitution envisions. Once again, we renew our commitment to our determined democracy, forging a more perfect union. That theme for this inauguration, our determined democracy, forging a more perfect union, was announced by the Joint Committee before the election with the belief that the United States can only fulfill its promise and set an example for others if we are always working to be better than we have been. The Constitution established that determined democracy with its first three words, declaring the people as the source of the government. The Articles of Confederation hadn't done that. The Magna Carta hadn't done that. Only the Constitution says the government exists because the people are the source of the reason it exists. They immediately followed those first three words with the words to form a more perfect union. The founders did not say to form a perfect union. They did not claim that in our new country nothing would need to be improved. Fortunately, they understood that always working to be better would be the hallmark of a great democracy. The freedoms we have today, the nation we have today, is not here just because it happened, uh, and they aren't complete. A great democracy working through the successes and failures of our history, striving to be better than it had been. And we are more than we have been, and we are less than we hope to be. The assault on our capital at this very place just two weeks ago reminds us that a government designed to balance and check itself is both fragile and resilient. During the last year, the pandemic challenged our free and open society and called for extraordinary determination and sacrifice and still challenges us today. Meeting that challenge head on have been and are healthcare workers, scientists, first responders, essential frontline workers, and so many others we depend on in so many ways. Today we come to this moment, people all over the world as we're here are watching and will watch what we do here. Our government comes together, the Congress and the courts join the transition of executive responsibility, one political party more pleased today and on every inaugural day than the other. But this is not a moment of division, it's a moment of unification. A new administration begins and brings with it a new beginning. And with that, our great national debate goes forward and a determined democracy will continue to be essential in pursuit of a more perfect union and a better future for all Americans. What a privilege for me to join you today. Thank you.